Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Tse. And I'm Raymond Yang. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Clearance of barricades at protest sites put back amid legal wrangle. Government economists warn of setbacks if protests continue. A man who threw egg at John Zeng found guilty and will be sentenced in two weeks. The Court of Appeal has put an injunction to remove barricades at a protest site in Mong Kok on hold to make slight changes. This followed a challenge to the injunction granted earlier by a lower court, leading to uncertainty over when bailiffs can take action to clear the roads. Opponents of the pro-democracy protests scored a major victory this afternoon after receiving the seal of the High Court to remove barricades in Mong Kok. But just hours later, protesters lodged another challenge to take the case to the Court of Appeal. Under the High Court order, protesters on a part of Nathan Road must not obstruct vehicular traffic by setting up tents, canopies, barricades or other structures. Bailiffs can take all reasonable and necessary steps to help the plaintiffs remove barriers and seek police assistance if needed. The court also authorized officers to arrest anyone interfering with the enforcement of the injunctions. But no action can be taken before the order is served by placing advertisements in newspapers and displaying the details, both in English and Chinese, at the prominent location at the protest site. Lawyer Phyllis Kwong, who represents the taxi groups that initiated the court action, said they hope to complete such procedures by Monday so bailiffs can be caught in. But there was a twist after the original order was put on hold following a challenge by two protesters, Dominic Falk and Ng Ting Pong. Judge Andrew Cheung in the Court of Appeal pointed out the sections specifying the boundary of the protest area, portions of Nathan Road near to and between Argyle Street and Dunder Street, is vague, and demanded the removal of the words near to end. Kwong admitted the process might take a few days, but she is hopeful the removal operation can begin next week. But it was smooth sailing for a second injunction sought by a minibus group targeting another stretch of occupied roads in Mong Kok. Maggie Chan, the lawyer in that case, read out the terms in front of the cameras before saying she will meet her clients to discuss their next step. Despite possible long legal battles, police said they are ready any time. We will, of course, closely liaise with the bailiff and we will work out the appropriate action. If necessary, we will also consult the Department of Justice as to whether we should take actions or not. Protesters in Admiralty are not too worried about an impending clearance. If they want to clear uh, Mong Kok, then I think people should not fight back and just let them do it because we can just do it anywhere else and it would be the same. Every one of us here is always ready for the clearance of, from police every night um, since September 28th. So in my view, I think even though the police are going to clear up the area, it is not easy to do so. A separate junction targeting the blockade of roads near Citic Tower remains in force, but so far no action is taken. Student leaders preparing to fly to Beijing tomorrow to air their grievances over political reform have been told that they'll be wasting their time. Political heavyweights say central leaders already know their demands but are not prepared to accept them. ATV's Winner Wong reports. After nearly seven weeks, pro-democracy protesters are looking ahead to a planned visit to Beijing by student leaders. Alex Chow said last night that he and a few fellow leaders of the Federation of Students will head to the capital tomorrow to show Beijing that the people of Hong Kong will not buckle to manipulation. The students want the central government to scrap the restrictive framework for political reform in 2017. Many political figures urge them not to go on what they consider to be a pointless mission. Executive Councillor Bernard Chan said Beijing already knows what the students are demanding. 
LegCo President Zheng Yuxing said yesterday he would be very surprised if the delegates would be able to meet Beijing officials after failing to persuade former chief executive Tong Qihua to help them. In another development, the Independent Police Complaints Council admitted today that many of the 13-thousand complaints it received since the protests began accused members of the body of favoring police. I think uh, well, uh, it is very, uh, the members of the I membership of the IPCC comes from various backgrounds. They have they have different professional backgrounds uh, from different spectrum of the uh, of our community. Uh, as far as I understand and my experience uh, in the past few months, uh, all the members when they uh, sort of uh, uh, examine review those complaint cases, uh, they they all they have all done it uh, independently and fairly. Kwok plans to set up a committee to determine whether the complaints are legitimate and may invite former council members to take part. As the sit-ins continued, a citizens group has found that 40 percent of privately owned shops in Mongkok lost up to half their business in the past seven weeks. Winawang, ATV News. The government has warned that the economy and the labor market will be affected if pro-democracy protests drag on. The warning came despite third-quarter GDP growth recording 2.7 percent, the fastest jump between quarters in three years. ATV's Arthur Okula reports. After a drop in the second quarter, the city's GDP rebounded from July to September. It stood at 2.7 percent in the third quarter, up from the 1.8 percent in the previous quarter, making it the fastest quarterly growth since the beginning of 2011. Uh, the Hong Kong economy regained some momentum in the third quarter as local consumption picked up and exports of services also resumed positive growth. Uh, so reversing the setback in the second quarter. However, the government said because of the ongoing pro-democracy protests, it's unlikely the encouraging developments will continue for the rest of the year. The catering, retail and transport sectors in areas where the protests are being staged were badly hit. If the situation gets protracted, uh, the adverse impacts uh, would continue to build up and possibly extend to the wider economy, uh, making the business environment more uncertain and uh, with also possible knock-on effects onto the labor market. These negative effects are likely to show up progressively um, in the months to come. The overall impact of the protests on the economy won't be clear until the next quarter. Chen pointed out while there had been a recent increase in tourist numbers, the number of non-mainland and long-haul tourists had seen a significant drop. Local business sentiment has also worsened significantly of late. And, um, and as such, the investment um, going forward does not look very promising. And this is uh, uh, the two factors that we have taken into account in marking down the uh, GDP growth forecast uh, for the year as a whole. The GDP growth forecast for the whole of 2014 is now 2.2 percent, compared with August's prediction of between 2 and 3 percent. Arthur Urquiola, ATV News. A League of Social Democrats member who threw an egg that his financial secretary, John Zhang, has been found guilty of common assault. The defendant will be sentenced later this month, but the magistrate said the penalty won't be affected by a letter he received today. League of Social Democrats activist Derek Chan arrived at Eastern Court this afternoon, accompanied by other members of the radical political party. Chan had thrown two eggs during a forum attended by Chief Executive Len Chenying and Financial Secretary John Zhang in December. One egg hit Zhang on the head. Magistrate So Wai Tak today described Chan's action as uncivilized, planned, violent and unacceptable. The magistrate did not rule out imposing a criminal penalty, including possibly a jail term, after finding 25-year-old Chan guilty of common assault. The sentence will be handed down in two weeks' time, pending a community service report. So told the court that he received a letter this morning demanding that he impose a stiff penalty on the defendant. The magistrate handed the letter over to the police and said its content won't affect his decision. 
Speaking to reporters after being found guilty, Chan expressed his disappointment with the outcome. He said it is quite common for eggs to be thrown at political figures in foreign countries, and he disagreed with the magistrate that his conduct was violent. Chang claimed the letter might influence his sentencing and asked how anyone could be jailed for throwing eggs. The defiant activist said he will throw eggs whenever he felt it necessary to do so. Former Development Minister Matt Chai Kuang and a former senior highways official have lost their appeal against conviction for cheating the government over rent allowances. The Court of Appeal said it was clear the pair had benefited financially by their agreement to rent their flats to each other while claiming allowances. Here's Arthur Urquilla. Former Development Minister Matt Chai Kuang and former Assistant Highways Director Chang Ping Man were found guilty last year of cheating the government of more than $700,000 in rent allowances. But they escaped jail time and were instead given suspended sentences of eight months each. They appealed against their conviction, but were not present this morning when the Court of Appeal upheld the original verdict, saying there was no miscarriage of justice. The case against Mac and Tsang goes back to the late 1980s, when they were both civil servants. They bought flats under their wives' names in the same block of City Garden in North Point in 1985. From 1986 to 1990, they leased each other's homes while claiming government allowances for rent under a practice known as cross-leasing. In handing down its decision, the court said the agreement between the two clearly benefited them financially. The fraud scandal erupted just days after Mac was appointed development secretary in July 2012. He was forced to resign after only 12 days in his new post, dealing a heavy blow to incoming chief executive Lung Chen Ying. Arthur Akiola, ATV News. More than 1,000 people were forced to flee their homes after a fire broke out at a public housing estate in Kwai Chung early this morning. But first, in our local rap, a defense lawyer said former Chief Secretary Rafael Ho never abused his power when he was in government. Winner Wang reports. The lawyer defending former Chief Secretary Rafael Ho argued in the High Court today that the man who was once number two in government had never abused his position. In his final submission in the corruption case against Ho, billionaire brothers Thomas and Raymond Kwok and two others, Edwin Choi said the prosecution's case may sound convincing. But Choi went on to say it amounted to hardly anything substantial because the prosecution could not prove that Hoi had treated the Kwok brothers favorably when he was in government. The prosecution said the $30 million Thomas Kwok said he agreed to pay Hoi as a consultant was a bribe to act as a developer's eyes and ears in government. Hoi's lawyer rejected the allegation, saying his client's advice was very valuable. The lawyers for the Kwok brothers are expected to give their final argument next week in a trial that has already lasted 114 days. About a thousand residents of Kwai Chung Estate were evacuated early this morning after a fire broke out in one of the public housing flats. The blaze began in a third floor flat of Ying Kwai House at around 4 a.m. Firefighters put out the blaze in an hour and one person was taken to hospital for smoke inhalation. Winawang, ATV News. Overseas, U.S. President Barack Obama has criticized Myanmar for an election law that prevents democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi from running for the country's top job. Obama met Suu Kyi for talks on progress her country has made as it moves towards greater democracy. ATV stars will report. Fresh from his talks with Southeast Asian leaders at the ASEAN summit in Myanmar, U.S. President Barack Obama visited the country's biggest city to meet democracy icon Aung San Suu Kyi. In a joint news conference in Yangon, the two Nobel Prize laureates outlined their visions for Myanmar, which has embarked on a path to democracy after decades of military rule. Our reform process is going through let us say a, a bumpy a, a bumpy patch but this bumpy patch is something that we can negotiate with commitment and with the help and understanding of our friends from all over the world obama echoed the sentiment it's clear how much hard work remains to be done and that many difficult choices still lie ahead the process for reform is by no means complete or irreversible for many, progress has not come fast enough or spread far enough. Uh, people need to feel safe in their homes. 
Myanmar goes to the polls next year, but Suu Kyi will not be able to run for the presidency because her two sons are foreign nationals. Obama said the election rule made no sense and called for change in the former British colony, also known as Burma. It will be critical to ensure that all of Burma's people can participate in shaping the future of their country. Last night, Obama pressed Myanmar President Thein Sein to hold inclusive elections, but acknowledged that there have been improvements since his first visit two years ago to Myanmar, which is rich in natural resources. Uh, the economy has begun to grow. Political prisoners have been set free. Uh, there are more newspapers and media outlets. Children have been released from the military. Obama's next stop is Australia for the G20 summit at the end of a regional swing, which began with the APEC conference in Beijing. Joyce Wu, ATV News. World leaders have descended on the Australian city of Brisbane for the G20 summit. UK Premier David Cameron seized the opportunity before the talks to condemn extremism. Arthur Okela reports. On the eve of the G20 summit, British Prime Minister David Cameron visited Canberra, where he met his Australian counterpart Tony Abbott to discuss how to tackle terrorism, before going on to address Parliament. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. In a hard-hitting speech, Cameron took aim at Islamic State, the militant group that is sowing terror in Syria and Iraq. Hundreds of Europeans, including many from Britain, have flocked to the Middle East to join the extremists. Cameron said he'll act against British recruits. We will shortly be introducing our own new counter-terrorism bill in the United Kingdom. New powers for the police at ports to seize passports, to stop suspects travelling, and to stop British nationals returning to the UK unless they do so on our terms. New rules to prevent airlines that don't comply with our no-fly lists or our security screening measures from landing in the UK. Cameron said while those preaching hate will be targeted, efforts must be made to ensure that innocent people are not tarred with the same brush. We must ban extremist preachers from our countries. We must root out extremism from our schools, universities and prisons. As we do so, we must work with the overwhelming majority of Muslims who abhor the twisted narrative that has seduced some of our people. We must continue to celebrate Islam as a great world religion of peace. Britain and Australia have joined a US-led coalition to stop Islamic State from conquering more territory. Cameron and Abbott will join other leaders in Brisbane tomorrow, when economic issues will be in the spotlight at the G20 summit. President Xi Jinping is expected to play a leading role in the forum, which this year will focus on strengthening the private sector and creating jobs. The meeting could also see a showdown between Western leaders and Russian President Vladimir Putin, following claims by Kiev that Moscow has sent troops and weapons to rebels in eastern Ukraine. Arthur Urkiola, ATV News. On the eve of the Brisbane summit, activists have campaigned for action on climate change and the war on poverty. Relief agencies and grassroots groups criticized the government for not doing enough to help the world and the needy. Climate change is not on the agenda of the G20 summit and this has angered environmental groups in Australia. Hundreds of green activists and supporters decided to act by sticking their heads into the sand on a popular beach in Sydney to send a message to their government, which is hosting the meeting of world leaders. I just thought it was something easy enough to do and, I don't know, just let our voice be heard and to gather your most friends as well and it was fun, so we did it. The protesters said it's ridiculous for Australia not to address climate change, especially after the US and China agreed this week to cut greenhouse gas emissions. In Brisbane, campaigners dressed up as lifeguards and donned outsized masts of world leaders to demand urgent moves to stem the tide of poverty. The gap is widening between the richest and the poorest people in the world and we want the G20 leaders to understand that what we want is inclusive growth, that the benefits of growth must benefit everyone, not just the richest people. Relief agencies have warned that the growing split between the haves and have-nots is endangering the world. Unless more resources are diverted to the impoverished, they say, disease and social unrest could soon pose a real danger to the developed world. Joyce Wu. ATV News.